Welcome to this Astranti case study highlights reel. We'll be looking at a bunch of videos from our precinct analysis and mock debrief series that will aid you in passing your operational case study exam. And by the end of this video, you will be a step closer to passing your case study exam as we go through some of the key points we found in each of our videos for the current precinct. Starting off then, we have five videos for you today and each video covers different areas of the case study. Our first video is the precinct analysis, and this goes through the SEMA precinct for the operational case study exam. And this video aims to help you maximize your marks and perhaps most importantly, minimize your study time. Many of you have busy lives and cannot spend hours and hours reading and analyzing the precinct yourself. So what we do is analyze it for you so that you can focus more of your time practicing theory and the mocks. And so in this video, our OCS tutor James will be going through the company profile at the beginning of the pre-scene, which will give you context for who our pre-scene company is and what they do. So, first of all, Personal Best is the name of the company, shortcut to PB. I'll probably refer to them as PB throughout just to save um, time, although I do realize that there's only a one, there's only a few syllable differences between that, but PB is a company that manufactures and sells protein bars and protein powders. Now, before we get onto protein bars and protein powders, again, just looking at the words being used, this is a company that manufactures. Now, obviously not all companies manufacture, some just do uh, retail, some uh, buy in products and sell them on, Others provide services, There's lots of different types of, of company and different types of organization. So a manufacturing company is a particular type of company and it tells us a bit about what we can expect to see in the rest of the pre-scene and what the exam is going to be like. So from the perspective or from the lens of P1, obviously from a costing perspective, manufacturing uh, and cost is a lot. You can see how costing applies to manufacturing in, in the kind of straightforward way that it does. Um, as opposed to trying to do costing for services or, um, or other types of things. Costing for manufacturing is the kind of the, the basic, the bread and butter of costing. So different types of costing, different approaches to costing might be examined or uh, we'll find out. Pro usually we know we're told a particular costing approach is used. Often it's absorption, but sometimes it's marginal. Uh, very rarely it's activity-based costing, but it could be but obviously we need to know which is being used because if we're asked in the exam um, the benefits of a particular one or how uh, a particular approach could be adopted or what the difference is between what we use and what a different approach would be, we need to be able to make those comparisons. Variance analysis is another topic. Every single, uh, um, every single, um, what are they called? Um, variant. Uh, exam variant uh, that, the, that the examiners write has a variance analysis question in it. Obviously, it's a fairly broad topic. There's lots of different ways you can examine that, but it's a topic you absolutely will need to study to prepare for this exam. Um, other things related to manufacturing, kind of quite obviously, um, relevant costs. I suppose that relates to other things as well, but we're kind of trying to track down to P1 topics here. Break even analysis within the context of manufacturing. How many of product A, B, and C do we need to produce in order to break even? How many do we need to sell to break even to cover our costs? All those things lend themselves best towards manufacturing companies. But it doesn't just manufacture, obviously anything that manufactures, it sells. And so the sales part of it obviously brings in some other topics. Okay, so there is a bit of marketing stuff in E1. Doesn't tend to get examined, but it can help us with our analysis and understanding the company. So the four P's of the marketing mix, your price, product, position, and place. We'll try and figure those out as we go through. The product life cycle. So where is the company? Where is the product within the product life cycle? And more broadly, you can kind of use a product life cycle to analyze a market and see where the overall market is. We'll, we'll do that probably as we go through and get an idea of, of where the company is or where the market is and what that means for the future of the company and how it needs to respond to its position. Sales forecasting, 
as well. Um, that could relate to a, a, a P1 topic as well and, and looking at different scenarios of sales given different likelihoods and, and different uh, probabilities, that being falling in the kind of uh, forecasting part of P1. From E1, KPIs are going, uh, is a key, one of the things that um, is examined. So often you'll get variants where you have to come up for K with KPIs for different areas. Some of the areas will sometimes be sales KPIs. So some examples would be the cost per customer acquisition. It could be a KPI around social media reach or engagement. Um, it could be sales per visit to the website, just to give you some examples of, of sales KPIs. So let's carry on then. So we've got a manufacturer uh, who sells protein bars and protein powders. So let's have a think about that. What are protein bars and protein powders? I'm sure you've heard of them before. You may have come across them before. You may use them and you probably have some initial ideas of the type of customer who uses these. And it's given us an initial sense of the type of company that we have here. Okay, so from a, a business perspective, if we're, if we're going to analyze this, the first thing that strikes me with a protein bar is that we're talking here about food. So it's a manufacturer of a food, so uh, protein bars. And dealing with food immediately opens up some, some ideas, some potential issues. Obviously, with food, the first thing that came to me is the regulatory environment of food. Obviously, it's, it's very heavily regulated most industries are but obviously with food you have to be very very careful and so there will be regulation there will be safety requirements uh, mandated at a regulatory level or probably at the, at the national level probably probably even international level for like levels like the eu um, they'll have food and safety uh, legislation and requirements um, so um, the, the point of raising that, obviously, there is a cost of compliance with those different things that as a food manufacturer, you, you have to meet. Uh, we're also dealing with when we think about what these products are. It's a protein bar. So we're thinking about the ingredients, the raw materials. Obviously, protein is going to be a part of it, but this is supposed to be uh, like a snack, like a protein bar. That's something you would take uh, in the gym. It's got to have more than just protein in it. It's got to have flavors. It's got to have different types of probably natural ingredients. So those are all the raw materials that are coming in and the company is, is turning those into outputs. So we've got to think about the storage. Again, with food, we're talking about um, things that have sell by dates, things that are perishable. So the storage facilities might need to be, um, you know, might need to be able to keep things chilled or cooled or frozen so that your, um, so that your stock doesn't go off before it's ready to be manufactured. Um, that obviously incurs different types of inventory costs, bringing it back to F1 and your working capital. Um, what else is there? We've also got the suppliers. So again, if we're talking about protein bars, you've got protein, obviously. obviously a lot of these protein bars will have things, like other things in them. Fiber tends to be quite important. Things like nuts, um, legumes and, and things in that kind of area. So we've got, uh, you know, we've got suppliers, potentially local suppliers, but more than likely international suppliers, obviously locally. It can be more expensive, particularly if you're based as this country is in, the, in Europe, which we'll find out in a moment. But internationally, um, you know, if you've got, you might be able to get it cheaper abroad, but obviously that comes with perhaps a higher delivery cost and certainly a higher climate cost and it's less perhaps uh, sustainable, uh, less good for the environment. So we'll see if that has a, a, an impact or if that's a consideration for the company. So the, f the products are intended primarily as a pre or post workout snack for people who undertake a regular program of exercise. So if we're thinking about this in terms of uh, marketing and who it is our target audience is, we think about market segmentation, then we've got quite a clear target here of people who undertake regular program of exercise. So if we were to flesh that out a bit, we're talking about the health conscious, active, sporty people, who have that kind of fitness uh, and lifestyle and um, that's the that's a particular kind of person it's not everyone it kind of narrows it down to a particular kind of person who goes to the gym and so that's obviously uh, a key place to bear in mind 
obviously a gym is where people are going to be for this if that's your target audience then you want your product in the gym that's a key place to sell it you probably want it in other places too like supermarkets just so it's generally available but obviously at supermarket you're going to have a wider variety of people and so um you're less like you know it's not it's not an obvious pay place uh, for people to buy stuff like that if they're going to get it in the gym the benefit of a supermarket might be that you can sell them in bulk um, so um, now that's the kind of initial thing that comes to mind the other there might be a slightly broader um, or different segments or a broader target here if we expand it out to not just people who go to the gym and, and are trying to bulk up or um, to, to get cut or ripped uh, as the kids say um, it could be a weight loss thing it could be uh, restricted diets or food replacement so people who may go to the gym but maybe actually it's more about controlling their diet and eating um, higher protein foods and it rather than high fat high sugar foods so it's about a dietary thing um, it could be for people with who have a very uh, restricted diet for medical reasons and they, they can't eat a certain range of things and and or they have a low protein diet and they need to increase their protein for other things so there are other segments uh in addition to the the first one that comes to mind and depending on how this is marketed um obviously we want to catch as many different market segments as we can with a product like this uh which is fairly difficult to um uh, differentiate you know it's a protein bar is only gonna there's only so many ways you can do a protein bar our next video is our strategic analysis, where we look at the big picture to understand where our precinct company is going and how you can relate the precinct to key models found in F1, P1, and E1. And so the goal of this video is to primarily maximize your marks by highlighting some of the key points from the precinct, cut down on your study time by making a connection as well between the precinct and different theoretical models. So what we'll do in this video, starting by looking at the future first, we want to establish where the organization is heading. So we're going to look at and try and understand, take from the pre scene what we can to understand the company's mission. We'll then see if we can decipher and find any objectives and related performance measurements to those objectives and targets. We're going to consider the company's critical success factors, the things it must do in order to succeed. We'll analyze the company's t key stakeholders using Mendeley's matrix to put our stakeholders in positions uh, that tell us how we need to uh, deal with them and manage them. We're going to look at the company's governance, both from a perspective of corporate governance, but also looking at the structure of the company more generally. And then we'll finish off this section by looking at and considering ethical issues and issues relating to corporate social responsibility. Now, that'll be the first half of the video, and then we'll move on to the second half where we look at where the company is now and the models we use for that. First of all, we'll look at the marketing mix, and we'll look at the four Ps of the marketing mix to get a good idea of the company's products, the placement of its products, how it promotes them, and how they're priced. We're going to do a pastel analysis to understand the external environment in which the company operates. We're going to look at Porter's value chain and the, the different activities and see where the company is either adding value or removing or subtracting non-value adding activities. And then we finish it up by developing a detailed SWOT analysis. And that'll take into account pretty much everything we've looked at so far in the video. And then we take it one step further with that SWOT analysis and we use that to define a business strategy for the company and suggest strategies for the company going forwards and the things that are important for the company to do, to consider, to take advantage of their strengths, to overcome weaknesses, to take opportunities and to mitigate and reduce threats where possible. And having done all that, you'll have a much better idea of the company what it does well, what it doesn't do so well, and what it needs to do better. So let's get into it then and have a look at the future of the company. And we'll start by considering the company's mission. Now, there are a couple of different aspects to this, not just the mission. We're going to look at the company's purpose, the mission, and some values and policies. So the purpose is a really important thing for a company. It's all about why the organization exists for whom it exists and what do they hope to achieve in the long term. It's why did they bother making the company in the first place? What is it that they're hoping to do? 
Then from that, you can derive a strategy and the strategy is the way an organization will compete. What is it going to do in order to beat competition and to be successful in its chosen market or industry? Then from that, you, the company can determine its values. So what does it really stand for? What are the key things? Is it a quality product or is it more to do with a low cost um, affordable product? Is it value for money? Is it a real focus on innovation or is it a focus on uh, rapid expansion and being in lots of different markets? And then finally, we've got policies. So these are actual things that are written down and that the company implements to get people to act in accordance to in accordance with the company's values, strategies and purpose. So when it comes to personal best, we're actually given some information about this and we're not always given this in the operational case study, but we are specifically given the company's uh, mission. And that mission is to help all customers to achieve their own personal best and to live their best life. Now that's quite broad uh, for a mission, but that's generally what a mission should be. But the key thing to notice from this is that what they're talking about is helping all customers. What they mean here is their end consumers. Obviously customers could refer to the retailers that they sell to, but they're really referring to their customer, their end consumers, the people that consume the bars and the protein powder. They want them to achieve their personal best and live their best life. Notice there's nothing in there about food necessarily or health or protein or exercise or fitness. It's much broader than that. And that, that gives the company a broad enough scope to develop in other areas. Maybe they're starting out with protein bars, but they might go into other related areas, not necessarily related to food. Perhaps it could be um, certain courses or, or gyms or anything that basically fits within that general mission. So the strategy, um, which we can extrapolate from the pre-scene, at the moment with their current product range as the company currently is, is to produce high protein, low calorie, great tasting, convenient food. And that is true now and it will be true for the foreseeable future, at least within the uh, timeline of the exam when you're sitting it, because we know the company is going to launch some new products, but they all, they are all food uh, related products that fit in with the category of fit within the category of high protein, low calorie, great tasting, convenient food. So that's a much more focused and specific strategy than the broad purpose. Values, we can again uh, interpret from the pre-scene. We know the company's really interested in health, um, not just uh, going to the gym, but more broadly, uh, a healthy mindset, healthy, healthy lifestyle, and anything that contributes towards that lifestyle to ultimately help people uh, achieve their personal best and live their best life. We also know specifically stated in the pre-scene that the company has uh, an interest in and is committed to sustainability, most um, most notably within the supply chain and the suppliers that they buy from, where they get their raw materials, who they do business with. That's quite important to them. So expect decisions to be made in line with the principle of sustainability. And then finally, with policies, um, specific things in the pre-scene we know about is that the, the company has a target to be carbon neutral within four years. So that could be considered to be a target. But in terms of a policy, policies need to be put in place in order to reach a target like that. So you would expect to see some policies related to carbon neutrality. And that again, carbon neutrality or net zero, that means that your carbon emissions um, are equal to the carbon um, that you take out. So the idea is you want to reduce carbon emissions as much as possible and you can balance that off with um, carbon capture um, strategies and techniques such as planting trees or other ways um, you can do that. Carbon neutral within four years for a manufacturing company uh, that has suppliers all over the world and in their supply chain. We've, we've got South America and Asia um, and the, the manufacturing process for some of these raw materials uh, it's complex. So reaching carbon neutrality within four years is going to be quite a tough target to hit, I think. Um, but uh, and also uh, they have policies around ethical and sustainable suppliers. Again, that um, that we'll have to see how that plays out in practice, because, you know, all it takes is a shortage of peanuts or almonds or whatever it might be. And um, we're going to have to go to the suppliers that are available. Um, obviously, the other thing with sustainability, although it's very, very important um, for the long term, 
uh, it does push up costs in the short term and we know the company already has fairly thin margins so um, that is just something to bear in mind it's not saying that they shouldn't aim for sustainability but uh, it does uh, eat into your uh, margins so next up is objectives and performance measurement so objectives are really important for a company to have a focused target and for the company to have a whole as a whole to move towards things in the future they can be used as a way to motivate staff and really importantly they enable performance measurement so if you have particular objectives things that you want to achieve you can set performance measures or key performance indicators to see how well or how close you're getting to hitting those targets and so from the case we can infer a few specific targets and these these are slightly broader than a target these are maybe things that are coming up over the next few years but these are certainly things that we need to have in mind and there will be targets that the company has around these things so the production department um, the marketing team sales team they'll have targets based around ensuring that these uh, launches occur when they are um, supposed to so these are a few dates for you to bear in mind so we've got new product line launches for april 2024 so by the time you sit the exam that's only really what is it six months away and that'll be for the vegan line and for the peanut butter uh, for the biscuits we know that they are planning to open a depot in miland and that should be operational from january 2024 miland is a country on the other side of europe from sealand we don't know where sealand is so we don't know what side of europe they're on but we know it's a fairly fair old distance away and the company is opening a small depot there uh, to be operational from january um, indicating the company's plans for uh, international expansion there is a question mark over selling peanut butter. The company has had a discussions about selling peanut butter, but um, as of yet, they haven't made a decision. They're going to revisit that in May 2024. So that's a bit further away from when you're sitting the exam. But at the moment, we know the peanut butter manufacturing department is eating away at company's profits. It's not profitable, um, largely due to the inefficient machinery. Uh, but if the company, if it's, it's been discussed that if the company started selling peanut butter in sachets, then they could potentially make the peanut butter manufacturing uh, into uh, a profit making uh, center. We also know from the budgets that the company's a, a growth in revenue revenue is, is budgeted at 17%. So we could interpret that as a target to achieve growth of at least 17%. Um, that is less than the growth of 20% that we saw from the previous year. So either they're being prudent or they may have information to lead them to the conclusion that growth is perhaps um, steadying in this market so there may be some more specific targets um, or and particularly strategic targets that you haven't been told about um, so why that matters is if it comes up in the exam and there are particular targets related to perhaps what the launch of one of the new product lines um, then you know yeah that, that's that's something to be aware of but if uh if new pro if new launches are being suggested and there are no targets in place that could be seen as a weakness and that might be something you want to mention um, in the exam as a weakness in the company's planning approach the third video is the industry video now this is a summarization of the industry pack to help you understand the broader industry issues without needing to crawl through all these websites, synthesizing information, and then figuring out why it applies to the precinct company in the first place. We've done all the heavy lifting for you. And so now that you can focus on just reading it, absorbing it, and then getting on with more important things like reading the mocks and practicing the mocks more importantly, and doing other forms of revision in preparation for your exam. We're going to begin with an introduction to the protein products industry, firstly with a history. Now, the origins of protein powder can be traced back to the bodybuilding and fitness culture that emerged in the mid 20th century. And in the early days, it was only really athletes and bodybuilders that were consuming these products. And they were pretty limited in variety and often consisted of basic formulations. Then we jump to the 1980s and 1990s where we see significant growth in this industry as fitness and health awareness is increased amongst the general population and we get the introduction of various types of protein powders derived from sources like whey which is what personal best uses soy and plant-based proteins 
as well. And companies start developing different flavors and formulations to make them appealing to a wider audience. Then we jump to the 2000s, and at this point, the market has diversified considerably, offering products tailored to different dietary preferences and needs, and we have major sports nutrition brands becoming household names. Now, today, the industry has continued to evolve, and there is more emphasis placed on natural ingredients, minimal processing, and sustainable sourcing. Now, sustainability and environmental reasons is something that we're going to talk about a lot in this pre-scene, as well as plant-based and vegan protein options, which have gained prominence due to the increasing popularity of a plant-based diet. Whilst it's important to note that the industry continues to grow, so forecasts indicate that the global market for protein products is poised to expand beyond 114 billion US dollars by the year 2030. So, what does this mean for our pre scene? Well, Established in 2018, PB is in the category of newcomers. And what this means is that they're going to be competing directly with more established companies, boasting stronger brand recognition and reputation. And this means it's really important that they carve out a niche for themselves and they must find a way to differentiate their offerings. And this entails presenting potentially a distinct product or positioning themselves as a significantly more cost-effective option than their rivals. And as a result, marketing and branding becomes key in ensuring PB defines its own niche. Fortunately, PB has established its distinct niche with a competitive market environment through effective marketing and a compelling and unique product. Now, this has two key advantages. Firstly, that niche markets are typically less crowded with competitors, and this gives them an advantage of facing fewer rivals, and they can stand out and capture a larger market share of their target audience. And secondly, niche markets are characterized by specific and well-defined audiences, and this means that PB is able to develop a stronger and more personalized relationship with their customers. Meanwhile, PB's existing extensive range of products with a view to expanding into the vegan sector mirrors broader trends, affording them greater market appeal without threatening their niche placement. Our penultimate video then is our top 10 issues. Now, this is a compilation of what we believe to be the most common and likely issues to appear in the case study exam. While by no means an exhaustive list and in no particular order, this list is designed to focus your revision by giving you a list of subjects that you could revise to cover yourselves in the exam. And so once again, the purpose of this video is not only to highlight some of the key points from the pre-scene, but also once again, cut down on your study time by giving you a list of issues, a list of theories that you can then prioritize your learning on and save time as opposed to revising theories, which you're not entirely sure might be entirely relevant for your exam. And so James will be going through one of these issues to demonstrate how we pick them, what to think about, and the theories you'll need to revise should you see an issue like this appear in the OCS exam. Number 10 is financial reporting. And the basis of my choice for this one, first of all, it's a key F1 syllabus area. It's one of the few ways that uh, the F1 uh, syllabus can be examined in the operational case study because there are no calculations in the case study. And so, um, the application of financial reporting standards is, is a good way for the examiner to write questions. It's always examined. It comes up in variance all the time. And we've got a manufacturing company. So it, that lends itself to these types of scenarios and questions. So the likely issues here, there's a range of different things, but it's going to take the form of something like asset purchase or disposal. So we know the company um, is in need of some uh, update upgrades, this relating to the second point, uh, for the peanut butter manufacturing um, department. So if that, if they manage to secure funding and find some money to be able to do that, then it will be a case of upgrading machinery, perhaps getting rid of older machinery and the financial reporting requirements for that. It could be a question on leasing. So again, because we know this, the company doesn't have access to finance to make the upgrades that are necessary, leasing might be an option. And therefore the applying the um, the principles of, the, of uh, reporting for leasing, IFRS 16. 
uh, revaluation of assets if they are old or accounting for accumulated depreciation or uh, the revalue um, revaluation method of uh, IAS 16. Inventory valuation, slightly different from your long-term assets, but again, inventory is an asset and valuing inventory uh, for a manufacturing company is a type of question that could come up. Um, and another area is the impact of tax on financial statements, whether that be from the purchase of assets and you've got capital allowances or whether you're carrying forward losses um, to, to cancel out, um, uh, to, to, to claim against your profits. So there's a lot of different ways that this could come up. So the, the, the main, really the main thing you need to do is make sure you've um, revised those key areas of F1. So the key points to raise in relation to some of these points, and it will depend on which point comes up, but really this is more of an approach. So if, if something comes up with leases, I for a 16, for example, then first of all, you need to know the requirements of that particular standard and how to apply them. And most of the time you'll be told to explain the impact on the financial uh, statements of leasing this machinery that's valued at this much and there's these terms and conditions and these details. So usually you need to make sure you do note the impact on the financial statements. Uh, and you can do that by explaining the credits and debits. So if you're purchasing uh, new machinery, then you have to find its cost and then you have to calculate the annual depreciation charge on a straight line basis or on a reducing balance basis. You need to be able to find its useful life and all those kinds of things, all those basic double entry um, uh, methods for uh, financial reporting uh, You are things you can talk about if you're asked uh, how to apply a particular standard. And the relevant here, theory here, most of them are financial reporting standards from F1. So the, the particular ones that are relevant here is IAS 16, property, plant and equipment for your non-current assets. IFRS 5 for disposals or discontinued operations. For example, if the company decides to shut down their um, peanut, manu peanut butter manufacturing department and start buying that in, they'll have the discontinued operation. IFRS 16 leases in the case that uh, the company decides to use leasing as a way to upgrade some of their machinery. IS2 for inventories and uh, measuring the cost of inventories. And then capital allowances on assets. Um, it, that's the most like that's a tax question we see come up quite a lot. And finally, our last video is on the mock debriefs. After doing all of the above, you'll need to practice your mock writing skills. But breaking down a question and writing a solution is far easier said than done. This is why we have the debrief video series. These videos explain how we would break down the questions in the mocks and form plans to write a solution to maximize your marks during the exam and also help you learn from your own mistakes. To that end, what James will do now is break down the question to the first task in our mini mock to demonstrate this process. So I've been looking into our budgeting approach so as you go through, it's useful to highlight key terms that will help us understand what we're being asked to do. So we know we're talking about budgeting and the finance manager has been looking at the budgeting approach following a recent management meeting about discrepancies between our actual budget, actual and budgeted figures over the last two financial years. See reference material. Now each exam question will come with reference material and that has additional information for you to read through and apply in your solution. So what we have here then, we've got discrepancies between our actual and our budget figures over the last two years, and the finance manager is concerned about it. We'll look at the reference material in a moment. We'll just continue with the paragraph for now. We've been using the same budgeting approach for years, although we have grown substantially in this time. Therefore, I'm reviewing our current budgeting approach to assess whether it is our best option for going forward. So here's the context then. So we're basically, the finance manager is reviewing the budgeting approach. There are some issues. There are discrepancies between our actual and budgeted figures. That's one reason suggesting why we might need a different approach. And the fact that we've been using the same approach for years, even though we've grown a lot in that time, is another reason to review the budgeting approach. That's what the finance officer is, do, officer is, finance manager is doing. You as a finance officer will have to provide your assistance. 
So what is required, you need to write a report. So with a report, you make sure that there is a title and an introduction and a conclusion. And in that report, you must cover the following. Assess the advantages and disadvantages of adopting a participative approach to budgeting at personal best and explain whether or not it would be suitable. So let's just break that down into its constituent bits. First of all, assess. So these are the verbs that you need to get to know. Assess, what does assess mean? Okay, in this context, you can think of assess as meaning to weigh up something, okay? So you're looking at something from multiple perspectives, multiple angles, you're considering different aspects of it. And so that's what we're doing here. So we're assessing the advantages Okay, so the things that are, would be good about it and the disadvantages, the things that wouldn't be so good about it. What is it we're reviewing? It's the participative approach to budgeting. Okay, so we'll look at the reference material in a minute. That will give us some more details on this. But this is what we're doing. So what we need is advantages and disadvantages of this at personal best. So again, the way you get marks in this exam is by application. So if you just reel, reel off the basic theory of participative budgeting and some general advantages and disadvantages, but you don't apply that to personal best specifically and how we do things and addressing some of the issues up here, then you're not going to be able to earn all of the marks available. So that's one thing we're doing here. Also note that you're being asked to explain whether or not it would be suitable. So that's an extra thing as well. So again, if you just looked at the advantages and disadvantages, you would be missing out on marks because we also, the examiner is asking for your opinion on its suitability. So effectively, that's going to be our conclusion. So the structure for this is going to be, first of all, your advantages, all those pluses. Second of all, We've got the negatives, making sure that, that it's applied to personal best the whole way through. And then thirdly, our conclusion on its suitability. If we miss that, we're going to miss out some marks. So let's go and look at the reference material before we move on to the next subsection, because it will be a different task. So the reference material here on the next page, we're given some budgeted figures. And the comparison is between budgeted figures and actual figures. Okay, so the actual numbers themselves are less important than the difference between them, because if we compare the two, we can see that actual figures in pretty much all cases are lower. So we can see that um, in this case, actual figures came in below budgeted figures. In this case, uh, cost of sales, well, they came in lower than budgeted, so that, that's perhaps better. But overall, we are still a little bit off here, and that's meant that our gross profit has been lower as well. So actual results are coming in less, which means, as has been suggested, there may be a problem with the company's approach to budgeting. Here are some further notes. So budgets are prepared annually, on an incremental basis. So that means we are preparing budgets just once a year. Do you think that once a year for a, a manufacturing company with lots of different production lines and lots of different inputs and raw materials is once a year enough for the kind of pre preparation of a full budget or is there a better, more appropriate uh, uh, way to do this? The fact that it's done on an incremental basis basically means that we take last year's budget and then we add or deduct a certain percentage based on our forecasts and what we expect to happen. So we're very much going on and building upon what happened in the previous year. So we're using past performance as a measure for future performance. There are reasons why that can be suitable, but there are reasons why that might not be suitable. These are things we should talk about in our analysis. Key information is here. So we have many new operational managers who have come on board in the last two years, but they have limited involvement in 
budget setting. This directly relates to participative budgeting because we see that they have limited involvement. Now, if you were a manager of a an area of manufacturing, but you didn't get to set your own budgets, you might have an issue with demotivation because you might be set targets. So your budgets are set by someone else in the head office. So we see at the bottom here, it's Julia, the finance director who sets the budgets for all departments with help from the finance department. And that's been done since the company was formed. So you're not going to get any input from the department heads. So you're demotivated. You might have, uh, why might you be demotivated? could be unrealistic goals because they're set by people outside of the company, uh, lack of expertise in the budget setting process, um, leading to unrealistic goals and uh, lack of ownership as well. So we'll put that at the top. Um, if someone else is setting your goals and you have limited input into it, you don't feel much ownership over it, all of that, contributing to being demotivated. Okay, so these are going to potentially be, um, like addressing these could be the advantages. So the reasons why we might want to adopt a participative approach, because it deals with these aspects. On the other hand, you know, we know there are disadvantages. That it, it is simpler and more straightforward to have budget set by central department, okay? Uh, you've got less chance of uh, operational managers putting um, too much too much flex, too much room, too much padding in their budgets and setting easy targets for themselves. And that now brings us to the end of this highlights reel for our case study videos. However, these are not the only resources you'll have available on the Astranti case study course. And of course, all of these materials are there to help you pass the exam, minimize your study time and give you good value for money. Now, as part of the pre-scene pack, okay, you will have access to a pre-scene analysis video of which there will be six. And these will also include comprehension questions to help you revise the pre-scene, as well as the annotated pre-scene document you see in the video available for download. Then there's the top 10 issues, which we saw a moment ago, the strategic analysis and the industry analysis. And these all come as part of the pre-scene package. If you get these materials, on the Astranti course, then they will set you off in the right direction. And we have full confidence in these materials because we've been making them for over a decade now, and they are consistently one of the most popular products we offer, which many students have said were key to helping them pass the exam. However, what if you want more? You want more to practice on? Well, don't worry, we've got you covered there as well. As part of the premium course, there are a variety of products you will have access to, including mock exams that you can practice on to assist you in your revision and of course help you learn from the feedback and on that note we do offer mock marking and feedback on the mocks you write and offer additional support like our exam technique video series that help you become a better writer in the exam and included amongst all this is tutor and mentor support as well as three live master classes that you can join and ask our tutors questions that are burning inside you about the precinct company and the case study and you get all this, including the pre-scene videos previously mentioned within the premium level course. And as another bonus, if in the unfortunate event you don't pass the exam, premium course students do also get a double pass guarantee. Don't fret though, if you don't want all of these materials and just want the marks or the pre-scene analysis videos, you can do that too and purchase them individually. And so with that, we've come to the end of the video. And so I and everyone at Astranti want to wish you all the very best in your upcoming operational case study exam. If you want to learn more about the materials we have on offer, please visit us at astranti.com forward slash SEMA.